So let's get started. Okay, so this is lecture two of ECE 2305. And so in today's lecture, um, so last lecture what we saw was essentially this general overview. We saw the physical layer. We saw a lot of different types of protocols. We saw different architectures. We, we basically saw everything end to end. Oh, my favorite, I forgot about it. Transmission media and channels and the like. So what we're going to do is we're going to go dig a little in terms of these things called protocols. Okay, so probably a lot of you have heard, especially if you're setting up your laptops or your iPhones or your smartphones about TCP IP and what subnet you belong to. And uh, maybe you've heard of things like the OSI model and the like. So today, I'm going to add a little bit of, um, let's just say, um, some, some meaning. Like, what does this mean physically to, to say, oh, this, this, this guy here uses a TCP IP protocol, right? So when you, next time you fill out that space in Linux or Mac OS or Windows, you'll say, oh, OK, that's what it means, right? And what does it mean to have a protocol layer or protocol architecture with your communications device? So there's going to be a lot of drawing, OK? OK, so we're going to talk a little bit about the generic protocol architecture. We'll then go into TCP IP, and then finally wrap things up with OSI, which is another type of architecture. And I'll show the similarities and the differences between it and TCP IP. All right, so why do we need a protocol? I think I mentioned this in the last class. Like, you know, as human beings, we can kind of figure out um, when we talk with each other, when we communicate, what protocol we have. Like, for instance, like if, like, I'm not sure how many of you, like, you know, let's say I'm in my office, right, and I'm typing away. Like, how would you want to establish communications with me? Like, do you just, like, walk into my office, go straight up to me, and start talking while I'm, like, focusing, and maybe I have headphones, and then I turn and I get startled? No. What happens is the protocol there is you come to the edge of my door, try and get my eye contact somehow from my peripheral vision, and if that fails, knock, 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 right? And then, oh, oh, okay, come in. Hey, there's a protocol, right? We establish a communication channel by some sort of process of an auditory signal, in this case a knock on the door or on the frame of the door, and then I acknowledge and say, oh, hey, yeah, yeah, come in, come in, and we then establish communication. Communication systems are actually not that smart, right? They usually, so what we need to do is establish a set of rules, so a process that the two radios say, oh, I think this guy's talking with me. What data rate? What channel? How do we know that we are aligned in sync with each other to establish that communication? We don't talk over each other. Right? Oh, yes, like, you know, maybe a bit of insight onto my married life. My wife loves it when I talk over her. No, no, no. So, you know, like, let's say she's talking about her day, and all of a sudden, oh, by the way, did you know about the sports scores? Bad. That's, a ba that's why we have protocols. I wait, and it's like, you know, listen to how her day was. And then I say, oh, that's really great. So you had a tough day. Oh, by the way, did you hear about, like, you know, the Patriots? I think they won yesterday or something. So, you know, there's a protocol. So communication systems have much the same thing, right? So there are rules, there's conventions, and there's three main features of a, of a protocol. There's syntax. Is it integer? Is it signed or not signed? Is it float? Is it a string? What format is that data, right? Second is the semantics, the control channel. How do we agree upon, let's say, like, you know, uh, like, you know the, uh, how do we agree upon the process in which we exchange that information, the channel that we communicate on, um, like, you know, how long I should be communicating for? Um, essentially, what I'm trying to do is, how do we make it such that we maximize efficiency when we talk with each other? And, of course, error handling. What happens if that message did not come across? We'll see that TCP says, oh, you did not get my last message? Let me repeat, right? UDP, which we'll also talk about, says, Bleh. I'm just going to continue sending stuff, right? And then lastly, the timing. Timing's really important. If you're not matched up, it's almost like dancing. If you're not timed well with your partner, you end up walking on, people begin walking on each other's feet. That's really bad. Okay, this is a very wordy slide. But what essentially this slide, the bottom line is, is divide and conquer, 
right? So what happens is if we try and make all of this, the syntax, the semantics, and the timing, and we have all these complicated blocks and all these rules and all these things we want to accomplish in our communication system, well, uh, it's going to be kind of complicated. How do you debug something like this, right? That's, the compl th that's why what we try and do is we break things down into tasks. In fact, what we try and do, and what was really successful, and you know, communications folks, you know, when they tried doing this 20, 30, 40 years ago, like saying, oh, how about we try layers? Layers is always cool, right? So what, what people do, what communications and networking folks, uh, the way they design this thing is they have these different layers. Each one's responsible for a specific process with communicating, right? And what's even better is that each layer, all it does is it passes information below and on high. But it's individual operation. It's module, okay? It's layer. You know, you can mess around with it and play around with it, optimize it, and it will not influence above or below. Each one is logically defined, okay? And that's what we're going to see the rest of this class. Layers, layers, layers. And we're going to see how those layers talk with each other, okay? Yeah, and then, you know, things like primitive functions and the like. So, so what happens is, like, you know, those layers, you know, the ones below perform more primitive operations and the ones higher up perform more of the sophisticated ones. So we really break down our communication system down into these uh, different layers, each one with a specific task, and they gradually get more complicated as you move up. Okay? And so as a result, um, that's why when I mentioned yesterday, well, I don't really know much about networking, right? Like, I'm, I, I know a little bit. I know what an IP address is. I know about routing. I know about, uh, you know, like, let's say, round trip times and latency and the like, and probably application and transport layers as well. But, but I told you guys, I'm really a physical layer guy. I play with radio hardware and, and over-the-air transmission. And then the computer scientists, they play in the application space and, and, and the like. And what's, in, what's interesting is this layered architecture works almost too well. Because here I am in the bottom most you know, physical radio hardware layer, and I know that stuff, or I think I know that stuff, but, but I'm not really an expert on high. And there are other people who know the stuff up high, and they don't really understand what's going down, uh, going happening, uh, happening down below. So it's almost like it's working too well. But hey, you know, the price we pay for progress, right? Okay. So this is what I. Uh, this is one of these examples I wanted to share with all of you. Okay. So this is actually in your book as well, but I'm gonna like kind of doodle along and kind of explain because I'm a visual guy, and like this morning when I'm like reviewing for today's lecture, I'm saying. What would be the best way to share with everyone this like, you know, really cool thing we call uh, uh, protocol layer architectures? Okay, where's the pen? Ah, here we go. Good man. Okay. So let's say, let's say we just deal with wired, wired, uh, wired networks, just for the sake of simplicity. Okay. So let's say we have this guy here. Let's say this is a computer, okay? So this is a wired network, and this is a computer, and this is another computer. Ah. And this is yet another computer. And let's say, let's say, you know, these guys, it's great. Like, I'm not sure how many of you like working offline. Maybe it increases your productivity and there's less temptation you know, to go on Facebook or whatever social media sites you like or CNN or news sites. But suppose you want these guys to network together. Let's say you're using Dropbox and you're sharing files and you're trying to do a project together, right? And so let's say your network, and this is sort of the general symbol for a network, is a cloud, okay? So here's your communications network. Okay? And these computers are all connected to it. Okay? So the thing is, let's suppose you want to run some sort of application, like, let's say, FTP. So FTP is the predecessor to things like Dropbox and all that. It's a very simple fire tr uh, file trans uh, tra uh, transfer protocol. How would you implement this? 
So this idea of the protocol architecture and doing everything in layers is done as follows. So first of all, generically speaking, the bottom lo most layer, there's one that's even more bottom, like the, more bottom, use proper English. Um, there's one even lower in terms of layers than the, the, the network access layer, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. So this is your network access layer. And this also, network access layer, network access layer, okay? And what that guy is literally your physical connection of your computer to the outside world. This guy here, okay, what does he do? So he's the interface between computer and outside world, i.e. network, okay, that cloud diagram. Second, this guy also provides the network with the target, like, sorry, provides the network with the address of the target computer it wants to communicate to. So provides network with target computer address. And then thirdly, um, what it will do is, and we talked about this last class, it sometimes could, could decide whether you want to do circuit switch or packet switched connectivity. Remember, a dedicated line, logical line between destination, uh, sorry, um, source and destination computers, or it could packetize everything and share it across this entire comms network with all these other packets from all the other computers. So what that guy does, that network access layer, really is your physical connection with the outside world. With, that's where uh, the last step before your information from computer A goes across the network to computer B and computer C. Yes? Uh, sort of. That's a good question. So, um, so is P uh, CS more secure than, than PS? And it really depends. If you have someone who's eavesdropping, they can still pick it up. Like, so, so packet switching, there is, the, there is something about, like, you know, if you pass it through a router and you don't know where it's passing through, it could be picked up. The problem with circuit switching, especially with, let's say, things like telephone lines and such, is things like electronic eavesdropping. So it might have a dedicated logical channel, but if you know where to look, all you need to do is it's an electrical signal, and those usually emanate fields, and just a matter of you know something as simple as wrapping a coil around that line, let's say right outside the, the, the line where your information's leaving the house or something, like if it's a phone line, and then decoding it later, like, oh, this electromagnetic signal means this type of information. So, so it really depends on what do you mean by, by secure, is, is secure or like, you know, like you can put encryption and stuff and make it secure, but then if someone cracks the encryption and the like. But that's a good point. Like the thing is, is that if you're, you should, like, you know, being as paranoid as I am, if you're broadcasting something out into the open, even if it's encrypted, assume that someone's listening. You know, so, yeah, it doesn't sound great, but, you know, that's why I live in the middle of the woods with no electronics around me. But that's a great question. So, so this guy here, what he has is he also has something called a network address. And so what the network address does, it uniquely identifies computer A. It's like your home address, right? So computer A has a unique address that says, I'm computer A, and it's like some collection of numbers and maybe letters. Computer B and C, and this is also how computer A so it says, I want to talk with computer B or computer C, and it says, this is the address I want to talk with. The next layer is the transport layer. So what does that mean? What does transport layer mean? Ah, no, 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 no. I think that's crap. 
So transport layer and transport layer. So what the transport layer does what the transport layer does is it is essentially performs all the reliability operations for your transmission. So what the transport layer does is, okay, information received. Is it corrupted? Do I need to combat any sort of error that got introduced during the transmission? <laughs> if there is, how do I counteract it? Right? So the transport layer, after you receive the data through your network access layer, it goes up and then says, is this stuff good? Or are you saying in French, ça va? Is it good? And so what happens is, if it's not, it cleans it up. So suppose like you have some redundant information. Something as simple as, let's say, a checksum. Does the information in that batch of data that got sent over to the network, does it check out? Or does the checksum say, no, there's actually an error here, and then you can choose how to remedy it. You can do something like um, retransmit, and hopefully that time it makes it across. Or you can be a little bit more ingenious. You can actually put like some additional redundant information. So if something's corrupted, you say, oh, okay, there's something corrupted here. I'm going to take some of that redundancy and see if I can smooth it out and uncorrupt it. So that's the beauty of like uh, error correction coding, okay, or FEC. The last stage is the application layer. Application layer, the AL, AL. An application layer, what that guy is, what the application layer is, is literally, um, what that guy does is he, he's actually the logic that takes that cleaned up data from the transport layer and now applies it to whatever logic you have to perform the desired operation. So you want FTP? Perfect. It's going to happen in the application layer. Do you want SSH? Perfect. It's going to happen in the, uh, the uh, application layer. You want HTTP? You want web browsing? Perfect. It's handled in the application layer. So all these applications where it takes information from the internet or from the network, and then it says, OK, wh what am I supposed to do with this? Oh, it's a web service. It's supposed to, make a, it's supposed to fill a web browser. No problem. The service kicks in. It takes that data and interprets it as web data and spits it out onto the web browser. All right? You might notice these weird little bracket-like things, and you see this also in your course textbook. What are those? One, two, three, one, two, one, two. So what those guys are, we call them service access ports, or just ports. So what the service access port is, is the connection so, so what happens is you get this data, and you have your application, the, uh, the SSH, the FTP, the HTTP, uh, HTTP. And what happens is the transport layer feeds that information through one of the corresponding ports that matches the application. So let's say port 1 on computer A is uh, HTTP. It's your web service. Let's say port 2 is your SSH uh, application. Let's say port 3 is FTP. What it does is the data goes through one of those ports. All right? So, so, OK, a lot of definitions, and everyone's like, I'm falling asleep, and it's 90 degrees in here. I don't even know what 90 degrees is in cel uh, like Celsius to Fahrenheit. I'm like, you, like, small s side story, like, you know, when I moved to the US from Canada. So Canada uses ce Celsius and US is Fahrenheit. So I went to Kansas, and someone says, Oh, it's 32 degrees outside. I said, perfect jogging weather. But my brain is not converting. Oh, 32 is zero degrees Celsius, which is cold, like water freezes and stuff, right? So, but it, you know, it's surprising what the brain will actually pretend. Like, it's like, oh, it's nice and warm outside, you know? So, especially in Kansas. So, all right. Let, let, me, let me illustrate what the heck is going on, OK? Because everyone's like seeing diagrams and they say, so, so how does this work? Yes. Good question. Um, I do not know. Um, my, my guess would be it would be the application layer. The transport layer's main role is really just to make sure that th when the data comes in, that it's reliable, checks for the reliability of that information, 
And if it's not, corrects for it. The application layer is really where you do the matchmaking, like where you have the logic of the specific application. And so my, my educated guess would be that that would di dictate which port, because also what happens is if you notice in computer B and C, you don't have three ports, you only have two, right? So that would indicate to me that you only have two services available, two applications, not the three. So, so just, just based on my, like, you know, just on that, um, you know, like what would dictate how many ports you would have, it would be the application layer because of it would know what applications are running. Yes? Ah, sort of. That's a great question. So, so what I mean by application is um, the, the service or like the, the, the process, the logic that would take, let's say, this raw data. So, so it wouldn't be, that, that's a good analogy where you have a file type and you're trying to match it to, let's say, if it's a PDF file or an Excel file or the dreaded Word file, right? And um, in this case, what it's trying to do is the data comes in, but like, what is it? Is it an SSH um, data? So, like, I have a terminal, and I'm trying to log into one of the ECE servers. And is it an SSH session, an SSH data? Is it an FTP file transfer data? Or is it uh, web data? So, each one of these has a different sort of setup in terms of, like, what type of information needs to be fed across the network, right? So, so that, in part, is due, like, you know, that, those ports help clarify that. So if I know that the transport layer is done and then site is, it redirects that information to port one, it's telling me, let's say port one is associated with web data. It's going to interpret everything as HTML at, or Java or whatever, JavaScript. Um, but if it, let's say that information from the transport layer goes to port two and it's SSH, then it's like, oh, no, this is an SSH session instead. And very, very different uh, protocol altogether. So actually, that's a great question. Yes? Oh, no, I mean, they're, they're definitely there. Like, this is just a generic protocol architecture. Which part is our goal? So, like, net network access data. Which part of the computer is going to take that? Okay. Okay, so good question. So the question is, what parts of the computer controls this? And the, the answer is, this is essentially built, built in partly, like, let's say if you take a computer, it's partly the uh, computer's OS. It's also part of the computer hardware. So let's say you have a Wi-Fi NIC, or let's say you have a wired NIC. So you would have drivers. So what the drivers would do, and we didn't talk about this yet. This would be in the TCP IP portion of this class. What happens is the physical connection of the actual hardware, the electromagnetic signal that comes over the copper, or the fiber, or electromagnetic waves over the air, would be translated into uh, you know, an actual signal that the computer can use. That's, that's done all on the actual, let's say, the, the, the PCI card or whatever, PC card that you have in your computer, and the drivers will tell how that hardware interfaces with the rest of the computer architecture. The information then goes into, let's say, the OS, and then the OS might have software that will do the rest of the, the, the like, it really depends, like, on the hardware. Oh, yeah, no, the application layer for sure is at the OS. So your SSH client, right, inside has something that says, okay, I'm extracting this signal now that has passed through transport layer. That's where I'm not sure. It could be on the hardware, it could be on the OS. But what happens is that information then comes to your SSH client or your web browser. And then your web browser takes that signal and says, Oh, okay, so this must be HTML data, and then spits it out as HTML information, right? So that's, so the application layer is very much tied to whatever application you have in your web browser. So similar to, let's say, opening a file, like a PDF, it says, oh, it has a .pdf extension, it must be a PDF file, and then if it's not, then it's a virus, right? So, but great question. Okay. But l let's actually go through an example of how this would work, okay? So, so suppose I have data here. I'm just going to call it D. So how would this work? So we're going to see this again later in this particular class. 
So the way all of this is packaged is the following. So what happens is, let's say computer A wants to send it to computer B. Suppose 2, OK? Suppose 2 is H HTTP. So HTTP is your web service. Let's say I want to send information, web data, to port 1 on computer B. And it also expects HTTP data. So what it's going to do is it's going to, first of all, send that information through port 2. So now what you've got is you got the data. Then you add two more headers. You have something that says from, I'm just going to put a little F because my handwriting's awful, from port 2 to port 1. So all at that stage, the only thing we know is that, OK, I know that on computer B, this application okay, that I want to send it to is communicated through port 1. The next step is to go from transport layer to network access layer. So now I add, in addition to these two guys, so from 2 to 1, I add two more guys. I add from computer A to computer B. And so now what I've done is I've set up my data where I say, here's the source of the information in terms of the network access layer, something that the network access layer throughout the network will understand, and the destination, where I want to send it, which computer on the network I want to send it from a network access layer perspective. Then I also, in addition, indicate where, which one of these ports that information came from on computer A and where it should be sent to on computer B. So now, so let's take a close-up of this guy here. And it will look like this. So from computer A to computer B, from port 2 to port 1, and then you have your data. Sometimes the data is referred to as a payload. Okay, So that's the actual useful thing. The rest of that stuff we call overhead. Okay. So the data is the payload. And this is your overhead. The information, with this information, you send it over to the network. And the network will say it has routers and stuff. And it will say, oh, yeah, computer 2. Just turn, make a left, and you can't miss it. Oh, I love it when you get directions. You can't miss it. That's a surefire way to miss it. Okay. So it goes through the network, and then it reaches computer B. So that information will have those four headers and the data, the payload. It then goes to the transport layer. These two headers are no longer needed. So now what you've got is which port this came from and which port it should go to and the data. And then it says, oh, I need to go through port 1. And then that port, when it goes through there, goes into your application at computer B. All right? So, yes? How does computer 1 know that computer 2 is port 1? I was asking that myself when I was doing this. <laughs> so, so, theor so this is my, my mistake very sloppy, but what usually happens is you have the ports that are agreed upon by, let's say, some sort of standards organization. So yeah, shame on me. But what would happen is, like, let's say, for instance, um, SSH, the standard is uh, 20, uh, 23. And then there are a variety of other ports where everybody agrees upon, although, although you can set it up to be something else. Like, so if you really want to be very crafty. So for instance, if you're really afraid of hackers and such, you can set up your SSH, let's say, to be on an unassigned port so that only you, your client, and that target computer 
knows which port that is. So that's an excellent question. So here it's a little bit of sloppiness, but in reality, and you can check this up, like if you go in online and it's like, what are the standard port associations, there will be a laundry list of them. Yes? Are ports bidirectional? Yes. Okay. Yes. Because this operation here, let's say, like, let's say this is an SSH application, or, uh, a, 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 <laughs> HTTP, um, and you want to send acknowledgement saying, yeah, I received the data or something like that. You can, so yeah, they could definitely. went out port two and went in port one. Yeah, I, I, in hindsight, I should make it two as well, but, yeah. but, but in reality. So it would be the same, you would have the same port and for the same type of data on both sides. Exactly. Okay. For the same application. Same application. Same application. Yep, right. yep. Perfect. Okay, good. So, so, so in essence, this is what happens when you, when you send data. Let, let's say you have a web server and you have a web browser on your laptop. This is what ends up happening. That web server will essentially pack it, will, will progressively package up your data with all these different header informations that will allow it to reroute it all the way to your application on your laptop in Windows or Mac OS or in Ubuntu or whatever operating system that you're using. All right. Yeah, it is really hot in here. <laughs> OK. So, so TCP IP, so TCP IP is a little bit more specific than what we just looked at, but only slightly. So there's a few differences compared to, like, so what I just showed you was sort of the generic, like, you know, this could be anybody's type of network architecture. But TCP IP is one of two network architectures, right? Uh, pro uh, protocol, um, protocol architectures uh, that were proposed. This one was proposed by the um, uh, US uh, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, so DARPA. So they, they basically sponsor all sort of DOD related projects, including your friend, the internet, okay? So originally the internet, like what I described in last class, was meant to be um, uh, used in sort of defense networks and such. It's supposed to be resilient, uh, immune to attacks, yada, yada, yada. Now it's, you know, you go on Amazon, you can order stuff, uh, you can watch movies. Definitely non-defense related type of things, right? What's interesting is that as opposed to the three layers that I described, um, TCP IP has five. Okay. I'll talk about OSI layer. It has way more layers. Unfortunately, OSI did not catch on as well as TCP IP. Basically, TCP IP beat OSI to the punch. Aw, happens. So we have layer five. That's the application layer. We should all be very happy. We know what application layer is, right? Your web browser, your SSH client, uh, what, whatever sort of software that accesses the network, right? and gets data from the network. That would be an application. You have the transport layer. We know what that is. And then the bottom three, internet layer, link layer, and physical layer. So there's a lot of debate of what physical layer means. So I deal with radio hardware and you know uh, wireless signals picked up by the radio hardware. And I would say, oh, I'm physical layer. But then you might have the people who design the antennas and design the radio frequency hardware and say, no, we're real physical hardware. I'm not sure what you guys are. So everybody has like, you know, everyone claims that they're the real physical layer folks. Link layer, it's a little bit different. So link layer really focuses on how to establish that communication link with, let's say, another computer at, at the other end of the network. And then you have the internet layer. That's where we get the IP address. Right? So link layer is like where your MAC address occurs. So it's medium access. So who should access that channel at any given time? Who should access that, that uh, let's say, that um, coax cable and, and, and the like? like who, basically, how do you access that uh, wireless environment or that uh, transmission line to get from point A to point B? And then the internet layer, well, that's how you navigate across a network. So that's where your IP address comes into play. So the next like five slides basically are like this is what physical error like you know basically is a sort of a laundry list of what each one of these things mean, but just to quickly go through these, so the physical error really is the individual transmission of bits. I would even say physical error goes more than that. It, the physical error 
is the prop, like I would say, it goes all the way down to the electromagnetic energy that you spew onto the fiber, onto the twisted copper pair, onto your gigabit ethernet line, onto the airwaves wirelessly. It's basically everything that accesses your radio access to the world. That is physical air, right? So the bit, the bit a lot of people say, yeah, that's the fundamental unit of energy. I would protest, I would actually say it's lower than that. It's the um, electrons that propagate through the air, right? Or on that, that uh, copper line. So think like, for instance, like the examples here, like the ethernet cable or, you know, copper twisted pairs. So that, that's basically the blue lines that you guys have. Or coax cables or fiber optic uh, cables. And then wireless LAN, you have the wi wireless propagation. Basically, um, it's that antenna. If you go into AK227, you see those little white boxes? Nah, I'm not going to ask you guys to open it because you'll destroy my precious white boxes. But you see the antenna that's sticking out that looks like, um, um, uh, what is it? Like, you know, like your wireless access point. And then there's a little green PCB card with little black blobs. That's physical air. Basically, to th those ones and zeros that get transmitted as electromagnetic energy on a wire or over the air, that's the, all that is the physical. The link layer, what happens is this figures out how to exchange data between the two devices, and that is done through something called frames. So you have ones and zeros, and it's trying to figure out, okay, how does this frame get over to that computer? And so it needs to figure out, is the channel available? Can I transmit without interfering with someone else? Uh, is the other guy waiting for me? That's link layer. It literally is trying to figure out the link between two computers. Yes? Exactly. Exactly. So, so the question is, uh, d does one computer try and figure out um, on its own how, how to sort of navigate the, uh, you know, the, the network environment? And the, amps, the answer is yes, because there's something called Medium Access Control, or MAC. So you might have heard of that. So what Medium Access Control, the medium is, let's say, your wired or wireless environment. And depending on how your network is, so Wi-Fi, uh, the, the, um, uh, we would call it contention base. It's like first come, first serve. So if the channel's occupied, oh, I'm going to wait a few seconds and see if it's going to be occupied then. And, and whoever gets to that medium, to that channel first, gets dibs on that channel and transmits their information. So that would be one MAC protocol, if you will, for accessing that channel. And so you can have, let's say, all these radios. And because you know, data comes in at different times, different rates, like you know, it's very random. So they, all these link layers are all trying to figure out, trying to size up, oh, is this computer transmitting? Is this computer transmitting? Is that computer transmitting? And if it's not, oh, OK, I'm going to transmit my, my information right now. So that's what link layer does. That's an excellent question. Thank you. Internet layer. So the internet layer, we've seen these. And the information that's packaged here is called a datagram. And it has a tag called an IP address. This is something that you probably all know and love, right? When you're configuring your computer, I need an IP address. Or you go to CCC, help desk, I need an IP address. So this is how your information gets routed. So you, you throw your information out into the wild, wild west of the network. And then you have routers, you have switches, you have servers. How do you know that your information is going to get to the right place? Oh, I have this IP address. It knows where to send it. OK, 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 OK. So it says, oh, you, you want to go to 192.168.11? Oh, you need to turn left. You can't miss it. right? So that's what the um, uh, internet layer does. All right. Transport layer, yada, yada, yada. Same as before. Make sure we have reliable communications, right? And if there's error, we'll fix it. And we'll figure out what we embed redundant information into that, all right? And so this is where the fun begins. This is where the TCP versus UDP comes in. You might say, what's the diff? They're both three-letter acronyms. There's a huge difference, huge. <laughs> so here's the difference. 
TCPIP, no, sorry, TCP, Transmission Control Protocol, this guy here actually tries to be reliable. What happens is this is where we have the automatic repeat request. What happens is if the data, we send it, and then let's say the receiver says, hey, 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 I, I, I didn't quite get that. Can you repeat? Yeah, no problem. Here you go again, right? So what happens is in uh, TCP, there is a huge priority on getting the information across, even if it requires retransmission of that data. UDP doesn't have that type of reliability built into it. It's like, essentially, does, uh, as it says here, it's like a lot of nodes. It's very negative. No guaranteed data delivery. No preservation of the sequence. No protection, uh, protection against duplication. Like, it's almost like, you know, which cell phone plan would you choose? You know what? Uh, here. But the nice thing about UDP, if you, if you just want to keep things lean and you don't care about losing some information, UDP is the way to go. So some of my radio hardware, all I care about is getting the data across. If I drop a few packets, c'est la vie. That's life. So what, and, and, and so TCP, on the other hand, has this overhead where it's like, did you get my signal? Yes, I did. Can I send another? Sure you can. I'm like, get with it. On the other hand, you have this other standard that's just shoveling information. Oh, you lost a few? Well, that's OK, but you got most of it across, right? So that, that's really the fundamental difference between the two of these guys. Finally, you have your application layer, a lot of acronyms, things like SMTP. That's your mail protocol. Oh, yeah, I forgot. That's another thing. Mail has its own application, right? So if the information comes in, oh, that's a mail application. OK, and then you read your email, right? Different than web, different than SSH, different than FTP, right? And then there are a variety of others. Even BitTorrent and eDonkey and all these guys, they too have different protocols. OK, and then there's a variety of different addresses. So let, let me jump into like, you know, the data flow. Like, you know, how does this work in a TCP IP environment? <coughs> Phew. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. So, so let's look at TCP IP in action. Okay. So let's say you have host A. You have host B, okay? So you have your computer, and it's actually kind of interesting because what happens is, suppose you have a web server, and then you have your MacBook or whatever type of laptop, right? They might not use even, let's say one guy is using Wi-Fi, but it's like 802.11a, and another guy, let's say it's a wired connection, so totally different networking technologies. So what happens? What happens is this guy communicates by his physical layer. That's the actual physical, physical radio hardware. Okay, Here's the, its network. And then what happens is it goes through a router. It has a physical standard. Let's say this one too. Let's say that's phi layer 1, phi layer 2. Then there's the network access layer network access layer 1 and 2. And then what you've got is your internet layer, right? And what this guy does, so that's your comm network, and that's your comm network here. What this guy does is essentially your information goes into the network, it appears at this router. And then what the router does is it takes that information and it says, OK, where, sh where should I send it? And it sends it according to what the IP address uh, that's contained in that information says. So let's say, oh, the IP address that belongs to host B. You need to send it that way. It repackages it as a new a new signal, if you will. It passes through the network access layer, adds whatever redundancy, MAC address, you name it, transforms it into whatever signal you want it to be through the physical layer, 
sends it back over the communication network and sends it back to the physical layer. But let's, let's take a step back. How did we get there? So what ends up happening is both these hosts you know, have symmetric configurations. Bless you. And then we have you know, our, our TCP. And then this is our application layer. So one, two, three, two, four, six. And so let's say we have that application again. Let, let's say it's web. Ah, this time I'm not making a mistake. They're both using the same port. Okay. So the way this would work is I would send the information through that port. I would add whatever redundancy or uh, protection that I would through the TCP protocol, right? So I, this guy is actually logically linked to the TCP. Logically linked. Logical link. To the TCP at the other host. And so these two guys, if let's say the information is not successfully received, the other guy will say, hey, 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 can you tra retransmit? And the host A will comply and will say, OK, I'll retransmit that information. So there is, there is a connection between the two hosts. So then the information is given an IP address. There's a MAC address. It also figures out which channel it should go on, right? at what time. And then the physical layer converts it into the electromagnetic signal, either on a wire or wirelessly, and sends it over the network. And then this router here, what that guy is doing is essentially Let's say some point along the way, you have two different technologies, uh, let's say communication technologies, that router will convert between the two. So let's say even at home, your router, I'm not sure how many of you have a wireless router with some wired connections. So suppose I want to talk with my wife, she's using wireless, I have a wired connection. What that router would do, it will take, let's say, uh, my wired information, and it would decompose it. it will, first of all, extract the physical signal. It will then uh, uh, you know, interpret through the network access layer. It will say, oh, OK, um, you're this time instant, and you're with this MAC address, and would remove some more header information knowing where it should be sent. It would then say, oh, you want your wife's laptop's IP address. OK, I'll repackage it as a wireless signal. So that's the physical layer. I'll add the information that belongs from the network access layer and send it over the air, the wireless network, over to her computer. And then it will decode all the way until port 2 and get to the HTTP application. All right. So what TC TCP IP does is almost the same as what we looked at at the generic protocol architecture. But what we did not see is essentially the physical layer. So here, we actually do care about the type of technology that we are using in terms of the, um, uh, whatchamacallit, like is it an air interface? Is it a wired interface? Is it using the same frequencies? Is it using the same signal strengths? Is it using the same type of signal? Right? Yes? Well, you know, what, what some hackers do, so I'm, I'm guessing, you, you know Bob Brown, right? Yeah. So ask him about how often the ECE servers get port scanned. So what happens is hackers will come along, it's like, port one, anyone there? Port two, anyone there? Port three, and they'll go all the way to the thousands to see if, and, and, and ask him where they originate from and how often, it's, it's insane. Like, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun to ask him that. So what happens is, People are always looking for some sort of vulnerability. So let's say if you have your own server, or like let's say what I do with my laptop, I block all and then make a few exceptions. So and it's only for traffic I believe should pass and nothing else. Good question. All right. Okay. So last but not least. So so essentially. Um,
OSI was kind of the loser. I don't want to say that. But what happened was OSI was another standard. So this was the rival. It was developed in 1984 by the International Organization of Standards, or ISO. And um, what happened is, unfortunately, it was a little too late. TCPIP took root. And that's what we pretty much use nowadays. And um, it's the same thing, layered model, but um, it has actually a few more layers. So it has like the application layer, we know that. But it also has things like the presentation layer and the session layer. So there's all these like new layers being thrown in. Transport layer, we know what that is. And then, you know, network and data link, that's more like our link layer in general and the physical layer. We're kind of familiar with that. But, but to, to end this lecture, so there's a lot of text here, but let me really show you what, what this layer looks like. And I always forget, so I want to just draw this out. So TCP is four layers, app, transport, internet, uh, uh, yeah, internet, and net access. OSI is you break up the application layer into three layers now. So now you have app, presentation, and session layer. And then transport layer is transport layer. And now you break up the internet layer into network layer and data link layer. And finally, you have file layer. So what IS OSI did is essentially they both have the same structure. But OSI says, I'm going to subdivide the operation of my protocol architecture into seven layers rather than the four. Not longer, but more complex. And so what the OSI folks did is they subdivided their operations very finely, as opposed to TCP IP, where it's just like, here are the four operations, just deal with it. And so you can have some very a complicated application and transport layer stuff. So they think the, they took divide and conquer a little too extreme. So anyways, uh, that's lecture two. <laughs>